Hello class, uh, uh, I'm Miguel, Miguel Itarango. I'm your professor for the uh, RTVF 133 or 131, excuse me, uh, digital editing. Um, I always get that wrong. <laughs> uh, so I wanna say hello. Um, this might be the first video you watched uh, actually. Um, and uh, what, what I'm gonna do today is uh, go over chapters one and two of grammar of the edit if you will look at the uh, the modules and the and uh, on Canvas, you'll see that I have provided for you links to uh, uh, files uh, of um, annotated notes that I've already taken of of the book. Now it's not it's not uh, completely comprehensive meaning. It's not everything in there, but it's a, sort of the highlights. But uh, what, that's the content that I'm going to go over. And this is a text, so Grammar of the Edit. Um, Christopher J. Bowen, so he's an editor. So pretty good text. Uh, it is a little expensive and pricey. So if you do get it, maybe do the ebook. But really, you can get uh, older editions that are just about as good. I've used um, um, a couple of these. This is the fourth edition. I've used the second and the third as well, I believe. Um, and uh, he has done updates. Uh, on uh, in this chapter where he's added a, a whole section on sound of uh, what it was before is uh, it was like a chapter five or six it was one of the later chapters but he had sound included in it it was a discussion on post uh, post uh, like finishing and and finalizing your video and that's where he had audio originally um, so instead uh, he went ahead and just made a whole chapter of it which is great that's chapter three I believe so we will be going over that. So it's up to you if you want it, uh, get a, you know, a used version of it would be great. Uh, but again, I'm providing with you all of the notes under files and uh, there'll be links in each of the pages as well. So, you know, you can find it. Um, uh, we're gonna use that text because it's a, it's, it's a pretty good text. Um, there's more, I, I think the reason why I'm using it is more because it was uh, something that I, um, inherited <laughs> when I was teaching a course at another place um, <clears throat> and that's the one we were using there and I just got used to it so I thought well I'm just gonna keep working and keep uh, I'm gonna bring it with me um, I myself um, I think in production identify as an editor I, that's the that's the part where I, I have the most fun I enjoy I know some people you know you have uh, different types of production people some people like the you know the the producing process where they just like putting the projects together. Some people like the writing um, and uh, directing or the cinematography, you know, some people like sound. Some people want to build stuff, you know, work as uh, grips and some are electricians. They want to be gaffers. So, um, you know, different people, you need different people for different um, aspects of filmmaking, but uh, editing to me. Um, and I think we, it's pretty much standard now. Um, editing is the the form, though, in the way that exists for us, um, that is very unique to filmmaking. You're not going to find this anywhere else. The way that we do it, you know, uh, every other aspect of writing, directing, even you know, the photography or cinematography. I mean, you find that in some of the other plastic arts, but not editing. Editing is very unique. Maybe sound mixing. And and with that, um, we say. Um, it ha there, it's a whole genre and it's an aspect of how we think about production. Myself, since I come from a studio art uh, practice, I, I don't limit myself just to filmmaking. You know, I, I, and, and in fact, when, when I think about my identity and when I talk about my work, um, I'm a time-based media artist. I think that's the way we think about it too. We took, it's something uh, filmmaking is something that takes time to experience. Therefore, that's what you are. You're a time-based media, um, you know, artist, artisan, um, or maker, you know, which however you want to identify as. But that's something to think about. Remember, it takes time. Music is also like that. It takes time to experience the piece itself. And, and that's how we really, really um, identify ourselves or... Um, um, use that as a signifier of our uniqueness in the plastic arts. Um, I have been editing for quite a, quite a while now, for some time. I, I think I edited my first student project almost 25 years ago. 
Um, <clears throat> I also used a laptop. I was using a Mac at the time, I remember. Um, I was uh, um, final, using Final Cut Pro, I think version one or version two. It was 1.25, I think is what it was. But uh, that particular version, I recall, um, was, uh, <laughs> uh, was necessary to run on laptops because before it wouldn't or notebook computers. So um, they, we needed a couple of updates before we could finally use it. But um, um, I've been editing a long time. Um, now, many of you, you know, might do some forms of editing on your smart devices, like phones or tablets. I mean, it just shows how far we've come. And it's very interesting, and I'm, I'm very intrigued by some of the new editors that we can find and put on our phones and tablets especially on the, um, I, I know the Apple uh, iOS devices um, more than I do the Android, but just the way that Apple has now incorporated their tablets with their, you know, their styluses, you can, and, and the software LumaFusion especially, um, it's, it's a very viable option, you know, because LumaFusion is like a cross between Final Cut Pro 10 and Premiere Pro, you know, it's somewhere in there. Um, just to go to show you how powerful that new software is. And some people, I mean, are editing, you know, some YouTubers, that's all they use. They use like an iPad, a, a pencil, an Apple pencil. And, you know, you, uh, they can shoot on their 4K cameras. I know Sony has a workflow and the uh, iPad can support those 4K files from those Sony cameras. Um, I know the a7 III, especially like what we have in school, will work on some of those. Um, so it's it's really interesting, exciting time that we live in. The fact that you can now just you know use a thousand dollar product and edit 4K and you know really edit very well professionally. And there's some really great workarounds and um, special effects tools that uh, you can use um, using other software, other apps like Procreate, where you can create like these really neat um, time lapse videos that you can then export into your LumaFusion video. And they also have, they'll have alpha channels. And when I say alpha channels, some of you will be like, oh, I know what that is. Uh, especially if you have uh, experience with uh, other Adobe products like Photoshop. Um, uh, but for the rest of you, um, an alpha channel is, uh, in the simplest definition, just uh, what the computer recognizes as um, transparent. And therefore, you can create titles with alpha channels, which means you'll just see the text and the background will just be transparent. So you can overlay over text. So it'll look really interesting. Uh, and you can put that over a color or over a video. So um, lots of really neat, uh, uh, you know, uh, tools out there for us. But we're going to focus on Adobe Premiere Pro uh, using, um, I will be working on a Mac computer uh, because that's what I have. Uh, we will have those uh, Chromebooks hopefully available to some of you to borrow if you need them. And you will be um, using a type of virtual office uh, environment where hopefully the experience will be pretty good, you know, and that, you know, you'll be able to get some work done. Um, my goal or my, my goal for this class is for you to understand at least how editing works. And uh, I mean, I understand that there will be some um, performance, maybe issues, considering the fact that you'll be working on virtual offices and virtual environments. So um, the, you know, the idea is to at least understand how these tools work uh, so that if you want to, um, you know, if you, you, know, you ever get a chance to work on a desktop or like a, on a local computer and the apps on local computer, I mean, the experience will be, um, again, transparent, to use that word, or you'll be able to move right into it smoothly. And you should be able to, should be able to. So um, the way that these classes will work is um, I would do a couple of video lectures covering the book and then we'll do a couple of video lectures for lab and that's where we'll go over the uh, everything on the syllabus regarding Premiere Pro. All right so let's go ahead and start with the book again grammar of the edit and we'll go I'm going to go over the notes and explain uh, what's going on in that text or explain what the notes are talking about. All right so let's go ahead and share and when I share too yeah, here we go um, here's what the uh, modules are looking like now. Um, notice I do have these uh, uh, resources for writing, research help. Um, if you need MLA help for writing, uh, follow these links. Here's the library website, um, writing center page. And I've even included a link for free film services. Um, 
these are all going to be uh, places where um, you can uh, watch movies for free or via um, uh, what or uh, not have, or in a sense, not have to pay for it. You might have to watch, um, you know, a couple of ads or 10 <laughs> or 20. Some of them have a lot. The one that I, I would recommend that you, the, or the two services that you can use though, uh, we do have as of now, as of today, let's just say as of today, July 6th, I know that we have access on our library. And if you go to our library website and go scroll down, you'll see a link to um, Canopy. And Canopy has lots of films, um, excellent films, and even some new releases. Now, a lot of this work is going to be um, uh, critical, uh, interesting work, mostly foreign films, indie films, um, just, you know, really well done films. You may get a blockbuster or two in there, but that's, a, that's the stuff that we're less interested in, or at least I'm less interested in. Um, some of your other classes, you might talk about that a little bit more. But uh, with us, we'll be thinking about or looking at films that have very, uh, to me, that use the form in very interesting ways. Uh, again, I think that comes from my studio art background. And, and you know, you, not so much the Marvel, Star Wars, Hollywood stuff necessarily. Um, it, it will come in our conversation. You know, it has to because, you know, that's how we can have a common dialogue. But at the same time, we'll also encourage you to um, branch out um, of your, hopefully of your, of your uh, film experiences so that you can, uh, you know, give a broader perspective of film and filmmaking and filmmakers as well. Um, the, one of my favorite quotes comes from John Singleton, the director of films like Boys in the Hood, Higher Learning and Poetic Justice. Um, he also did Too Fast, Too Furious, you know, but that's uh, not the best film he's ever made. The other films are much better. I would say, don't worry about Fast Furious. Worry about the other three. Those first three I mentioned are much better. But he said something once, um, uh, a critic once asked him, what's the kind of advice you would give to a new filmmaker? And he told that new filmmaker, don't watch anything out of Hollywood, only watch uh, foreign films. And, you know, and, and anything that's uh, before you know, the 90s, because at the time it was the 90s. And he said, anything before the 90s. You know, watch older foreign films, and um, that's a great way to have your film education. And I completely agree. Well, let's start with chapter one of the uh, grammar of the edit. And uh, so let's click on our module. And here's week one. And so I have some information for you all here. Um, so I'll, I'll go over some of this here. We'll be going over the text grammar of the edit, learning about Premiere Pro as a post-production video editing tool. We'll learn media organization, media ingesting strategies, project pane organization, software layouts, and by software, uh, more than likely Premiere Pro. Optimizing your workspaces in Premiere Pro, editing itself, and exporting your projects to various media formats. Um, there will be some film screenings I'll post and have you discuss an online discussion or maybe we can discuss in our Tuesday, Thursday, one hour meetings. Um, below are the lectures covering week one and syllabus. I'll also be posting a link to discuss the projects, um, further projects information for, that you'll be graded on um, in the, either in the Tuesday, Thursday meetings links or as a separate link. Either way, I'll let y'all know. Um, and. Uh, I already have the sections here, Grammar of the Edit 1 and 2 lecture. That's where you'll be able to access it. And then your Premiere Pro lecture will be here when, when I have that recorded and uploaded. So let's start with chapter one. Let's preview that. And um, I don't have this as a slideshow. I had this more as notes. This is just the way that it made sense for me. Uh, and I just never made <laughs> slideshows out of them. So eh, there you go. Um, so the introduction here. Um, in the text, uh, it, it, it talks mostly about what is editing and um, what does it mean to be an editor. And for editors, we're the ones who put it all together. We get all the pieces. Um, we attend a lot of the meetings, sure. Uh, but more importantly, um, we have the ear of the director. You know, we usually work very closely with the director, um, uh, very similar to the writer and the cinematographer. You know, so editors are really a key are really key members of, of uh, the production team itself. And uh, editing, maybe some of you don't think of it that way, or maybe you have started thinking about this way, but when we're editing, 
Um, uh, what you'll notice is uh, sometimes you're thinking, well, I see the script because, you know, you can edit with a script and you can see like, okay, here's what we're supposed to be doing and here are my clips. But I notice if I change a few things around, it actually becomes more interesting. So in the sense you're, again, editing, you're changing or you're just combining clips together, which is what editing is. Um, but maybe you put them out of order and in a different order from what the script says. So you are, in a sense, the final writer of the story. You're the final writer of the script. Um, this, I, w I shouldn't say story necessarily because your project, you know, might not necessarily be a, story, a narrative storytelling project. And, you know, we can also tell stories in documentary. Um, so it doesn't necessarily have to be fiction storytelling. But we, you know, as humans, that's what we do. We tell stories whether they be true or have an aspect of truth to them or whether they're made up. And uh, again, this is just another version of that in, in visual storytelling. But remember as the editor, we are the final authors of the script. We are the final author and, and the story itself that's being told. Um, so, uh, you know, um, in a way you are like a writer. Um, and and uh, we've always said the best editors, you know, are writers. The best editors also make the best directors, in my opinion. Um, the reason that, that I say that is because the editor kind of knows what, what comes, like what, what clips you want to join. And therefore, if you already have in mind how you might want to edit something together, um, that therefore will inform what happens in production. That informs what you're going to shoot. And hopefully, that will make your production and your shooting more efficient. And that's key, that's, that's important. That's sort of the name of the game with Hollywood especially. Those of you who are interested in Hollywood, efficiency and bringing your projects in under budget. That is probably the most important part of all of this. Um, you know, it's a, because it is all about um, uh, money making endeavor. And it's a, you know, it is a capitalist system, right? It's all about money making um, or making money both. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, in the end, sure, telling a story is great, but we need to be able to uh, make money for those studios. That's how you're going to get another job. Um, it's not about winning Academy Award. You know, Academy Awards are sort of byproducts of this thing. But um, this is why Michael Bay still has a job and has never really been considered for Academy Award, you know, as the best director of any kind. You know, but he'll always have a job because his movies, in the, you know, the Transformers make billions of dollars. Are they good? No, they're not great films. They probably won't be remembered past the fact that they were, um, you know, interesting examples of special effects combined, you know, with live action. Uh, but that's about it. You know, the, we're really not going to talk about the fact that Transformers Part 3 or Transformers Part 4 or Transformers Part 5 Transformers Part Two, you know, let's throw that in there. They're pretty much all the same story, just with updated graphics. You know, that's all they really are. You know, but again, people love them. They make billions of dollars, and therefore they're going to be made. They're going to keep making them. Um, but um, for us as editors, sometimes we don't have the ability to necessarily, uh, you know, rewrite that story, but we can give them the best version of that story. Um, now for chapter one, let's talk about editing basics. When we're selecting the shots, because many times when you have a, a production, the director will take multiple takes of a scene, right? And a scene is anytime we have a setup. Whenever we have our lights, we have our camera, we have our blocking, which is uh, blocking. Who knows blocking? I'll give you guys a second. All right. Blocking is um, the movement of the camera or movement related to the camera. Typically, it's actors with their movement into the camera, within the camera, and out of the camera. It's usually those three things. And, it's, and that's and how we position the camera in relationship to that movement. So that's the blocking. Um, so we uh, take that um, uh, all that into account. Because some shots, again, or, or let's say some scenes with these directors, um, you know, they might, we might have the same, you know, script, but it blocked differently with, with the shots. And so we can, sometimes we can choose the one we like. 
Now, sometimes it'll show up already saying, this is the one we like. Or if you're the assistant editor, maybe that's your job. You're supposed to pick the best ones. And then the final editor might pick the best of maybe, maybe they did 10 takes, you pick the top three, and then the, the editor, you know, the, your main editor will pick from those three. And sometimes your director will come in and go, what else do we got? And you can, you know, put more in there. But you're really um, um, putting clips together. As you select shots, you're creating a grammar. And just remember, every single show that you're on or every single film or TV show that you're working on is a new uh, language. It's a new grammar. So uh, even as an editor, your role in many ways is, number one, you're teaching the audience how to understand your show. And then two, you're trying to make your show interesting. You want to make it so that your audience stays there and, and, and you have their eyeballs and you have their attention and they don't leave. You know, you want to keep them. Um, uh, as I was mentioning to the second point, the basics of structure, movement and purpose and frame composition, remember all that comes into play. This is a, about production. Um, so we have to understand, you know, what's the story, what's the movement of the actors and the camera and what's the purpose and motivation in a lot of this. Um, so we have to keep that in mind too. It's like, uh, editors, you know, again, that's why I say the best editors make the best directors because you usually have a lot. Uh, you have a similar type of mentality as a director because you're taking into account all the aspects of the script, the performances, um, as well as sort of the compositions and the blockings when you're choosing the clips that you're going to put together. Now, in terms of a short history of, of editing and, and how editing has developed as a form, uh, originally it was straight documentary recordings. I mean, that's what film was, right? Um, those of you taking Film History 101 with me and maybe with other professors, you learn that um, uh, the first films that were made were just record, shoot something, and or crank your camera until it runs out. And we only had um, enough film, you know, that would a couple hundred feet or 50 to 100 feet that would fit inside of these little boxes that would record anywhere from 30 seconds to a minute at most, you know, so they were very limited in terms of uh, what we can shoot. But, and especially with the Lumiere brothers and the cinematograph, they were just doing straight documentary recordings. They were documenting events in, in France. Um, fast forward to the fact that we now have elaborate constructed narratives. And, and probably the ones that be, uh, became very interesting were the Soviet montage uh, editors, uh, you know, because they had this very poetic perspective on, on how we can edit that takes it beyond just a straight story. We do have uh, Cecil B. DeMille and um, uh, Thomas Edison, Edwin Porter, uh, Melier, and uh, definitely D.W. Griffith, uh, all of them to thank for the development of the Hollywood master sequence technique. And that's also going to be the um, part of our project one. Keep that in mind. That's our project one. And this is, the, the, and this is still the technique that we use today in every Transformer movie, in every Star Wars movie. Uh, and all that means is that uh, shots start off with a master shot, then we move to uh, which shows us our environment. Where are we? Then we go to the medium shot, which is usually the actors in relationship to the environment. Then we do close-ups, which actors love because they're, they can emote, they can have their Academy Award winning moments. <laughs> And then we usually end on a medium shot or pull back out to um, like an in-between medium master shot, tend to pull back a little bit or a two shot so we can give reactions. So, we, so the sequence usually goes master, medium, close up, back out to a medium. So those four aspects. Again, that's gonna be what we're gonna be practicing for our project one. Factors affecting editorial choices, next, okay. Now, editing is the act of assembling individual shots into a coherent story. Um, again, if we're doing narrative storytelling, but in general, it's the assembly of individual shots into something. That's really what I would define it as because uh, the work that I do sometimes is experimental film and it's not necessarily a story that we're, that we're talking about, but more a, uh, a topic, um, a point that you're trying to make um, like, a, you know, the way that painting works or the way that music works. The edit itself is a transition from one shot to the next. And that's what editing is. 
if we say editing, we're talking a noun. Um, and that's the assembly of all of these shots into that one form, that one project. But if we're talking about um, to edit, like a verb, then that's where, we, that's where we put two clips together. And the end of a clip is usually known as a tail. The beginning of a clip or the top of a clip is known as the head. So we have tail and head or top and tail. Uh, those, those terms can be interchanged. So the top is the beginning, the tail is the end. Um, the tools uh, that uh, we use now are computer-based. Uh, we don't necessarily use editing tools the way that uh, uh, we did like 50 years ago. Um, um, I myself spliced together some super eight millimeter film when I was first learning how to edit. When you hold it, it's like a plasticine. Um, so if any of you ever done any uh, uh, darkroom photography, it's the same material. Uh, but now we just use computers. And even if we shoot on film, we send that out to Pro 8 Millimeter or one of the other studios in Burbank. And what they do is they process the film and then they send you back, you know, your DVD with your files on it. And you can grab those files and they're usually ProRes or some kind of video file. And you can throw that into your um, editor of choice. Uh, that Apple ProRes codec is a really nice one and has, is pretty prolific and is, is used pretty standard across many um, uh, production, uh, many shows. Um, for our purposes, we'll probably be using MP4s or MOV files, but we'll talk a little bit about ProRes, especially when we, when we get into sections on proxies. Um, so we also talk about project types and genres. So what is the project? Um, once we know what the project is, this will affect your editing style. Um, in some cases, there's a formula that you follow, especially when you're talking about TV, because you're, if, if you're hired to work on a, something like a Walking Dead or a Game of Thrones or fill in the blank, you have to adhere to the style. Um, one show that I, that I always found was very interesting that at times would change in its style of uh, filmmaking and even editing was The Handmaid's Tale that's on Hulu, um, which I would recommend to everyone. Uh, the, the, I think that's one of the better shows out there today. Um, it, it is very cinematic um, to a fault, <laughs> cinematic to a fault, uh, because they, you can tell that they hire people that work in film. Some of the shots are too dark because they're expecting a lot of this to play like in darkened theaters where things will you know, show up brighter. Um, and instead, you know, people are watching these on TV or on tablets or phones, and it's hard to see some of the content because it's not bright enough. Again, this is why we say, depending on the project, that's going to determine what your style will be of editing. But that also means, should also, well, should also be the writing, the directing, the cinematography, everything else too. Uh, we'll be talking a lot of this discussion. Uh, we'll be uh, focusing on narrative storytelling. Um, but again, like I mentioned earlier, that does not mean that if you're doing a documentary, um, which is the work, the, the kind of work that I like to do, um, you don't tell a story there because we do. Um, we just sometimes get a bit more experimental in our storytelling. It's more, honestly, to me, I just find it more interesting, you know. Uh, so uh, think, remember, think of that. We're not just necessarily constrained in just one type of it, putting, you know, of <laughs> clips together. We can experiment with it. Um, pacing and rhythm, content, and purpose. So uh, in terms of how we edit, that's what those three things mean. Pacing, rhythm, content, and purpose. Um, those are limited by the production content as well. So it also, um, this also goes back to what are we making? What kind of footage do we have? So your pacing will be determined by, you know, what's the show? The rhythm and content itself look like how often do we cut? You know, what's, and think of it like music, you know, what's the beat and purpose? What's the point of what we're doing? Are we making just, you know, like a type of Hollywood blockbuster with a bunch of robots and spaceships? Or are we telling the story of a, you know, a former champion returning to uh, his event as a way to maybe uh, reclaim a former glory or, you know, maybe to challenge themselves and, I mean, to me, that's the more interesting story anyways, but hey, it's each their own. Maybe you want to tell stories with flying robots, you know, that's perfectly fine too. 
As long as you get a job, that's all that matters. Now let's talk about basic editing transitions because a transition isn't just, um, you know, when, when we have like a, you know, the blendings of two, you know, images together to create something, you know, fancy, like we see on uh, slideshows, but a transition is just um, a change from one clip to the next. Now we have our four basic cuts and transitions or cuts or, or transitions because we can have cuts and transitions can be used interchangeably. Keep that in mind. So a cut is just an instantaneous change from one shot to the next. That's a cut. One clip, next clip. That's it. Nothing, nothing special, just one to the next. One of the more popular ones though is the dissolve. This is the gradual change from one shot to another. We do have different kinds of dissolves um, and that all depends on um, uh, when and where the clips fade in, fade out. Because sometimes you'll have maybe one clip just will, won't fade and it just ends while you have another clip slowly fade in. And so while this one ends, this one fades in right where it ends. So you, know, you don't notice an abrupt change. It just kind of comes out. But there's no fade here, and this one will fade in. Or you can have this one fade out, and the new clip doesn't fade at all. So you can have different types of dissolves. And of course, then you have the, the most common is when two clips, one fades out, one fades in at the same time. So it's more of a blend. You have more of a blend. And it's really a matter of what do you want to emphasize as an editor. Once we get into transitions in a, in a week or two, we'll talk more about that specifically in terms of what that means. Because this is all about a grammar. Remember, just like writing, these different types of transitions all mean different things. We also have wipes where you have like a line of some kind that's progressive at either an angle or a shape. It moves across the screen and replaces um, the previous clip with a new clip or with the new content. And it's very graphical. There's no uh, trend. There's no There's no uh, um, gradual change in terms of opacity being dropped. And that's what happens in a dissolve. The opacity will drop. In the wipe, there is no opacity drop. It just replaces. But you can get. You know, you can use images. The one of the 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 best jokes from The Simpsons. I believe it's season one or season two. And you can do a YouTube search on. It's kind of funny. It's uh, Homer Simpson making a movie on his neighbor, Ned Flanders, and he keeps saying, you know, and star wipe. And, you, and then the star just, you know, goes from one clip to the next. So take a look at that to get an idea of, of how graphical wipes can be. Those of you who have seen Star Wars have seen wipes over and over and over again because that's, that was the form that George Lucas borrowed from samurai movies, uh, specifically Kurosawa and... Um, uh, the Hidden Fortress was the most famous, you know, the best uh, or the biggest influence on Star Wars. Then we have Seven Samurai and uh, Yojimbo and Sanjuro that also influenced Star Wars. But in those editing techniques that Kurosawa uses, wipes. Those are really good to end one section and start another. The last uh, transition we'll talk about today is fade. And a fade is where you have a gradual change from your shot to a color, usually black, or white and or vice versa from the shape or from the color transition to your content. So that's what a fade is. Sometimes the, the most famous thing or popular will be uh, fade to black or fade to white. If you're doing a wedding, it's usually fade to white. <laughs> um, fade to black, those are typically used. Now, stages of the editing process. When we're talking about editing, we're talking about post-production. Remember, there are three aspects to uh, every show. Pre-production, which is where you set up your show and you write your script. Production, when you make it, when you film it, you get your cameras and your actors and all your costumes and your sets and your makeup. And you, you, you do make pretend. You do, you pretend. You play a uh, superhero, right? That's when we have uh, make pretend play. And then the final part is post-production where we put it all together. I also like to throw in post-post-production because post-production is a lot. You know, it used to be just like editing and some color correction titles and you're done. But now with the special effects, I mean, we have, you know, we have to make all of the uh, computer imagery. If you have, um, if you want to use practical effects, that means you're using real objects, maybe in scaled form. 
you know, to stand in for other objects. So you have to make all, you have to do all that. And all that happens at the end. And then you have to put that into your software and match it up to uh, your uh, production work. So it's, it's, uh, it's a lot more that gets into post-production than, than we used to. But editing, when we put it all together, is a part of post-production. Really, post-production is anything that comes after shooting is finished. So all everything, anything from music to the color correction to the special effects filming. Picture and sound tracks are edited together. Titles are made. We do sound design, motion graphics, and then regular effects, etc. Now, we used to do something called online uh, and offline editing, but that is very specific uh, to broadcast television, especially in the 80s. Um, the offline project was when you brought in your footage at a lower resolution uh, because the computers of the 80s and 90s couldn't handle full resolutions of, of the video at the time, um, and then film, especially in the 90s. So you would bring in a lower resolution file do the off again called an offline edit because you were uh, it wasn't live you would create the edit and then create a sync list that would then um, when you got your full uh, resolution footage it would come up and replace the, the uh, lower resolution stuff and and there's your there's your show um, that's the same workflow that we do today using proxy files still works it's still amazing uh, in terms of uh the bill the fact that you can edit you know technically 4k files on the 10 year old mac which is what i do um using the proxy files because they're lower resolution and instead of exporting out a, a what's called an edl or an edit decision list now you just have a graphical lower resolution version of your show that when you're ready to export you just say okay here are my 4k files link them up and that's what it does it it just swaps them out and then exports them out. Usually at that point, we recommend you put that on a, on a co computer that is not 10 years old, especially if you're doing a 4K output, because then you'll be there for two days exporting and your computer may crash. That's a lot of rendering it's got to do. And a rendering is when the computer creates a, an additional file of your clips or your, all of your original media because they've been manipulated in some form. Uh, all right. Um, and again, the offline edits really because broadcast TV hasn't really been used as much. Um, and here to go over the, uh, the, the note online will turn the completed sequence into higher resolution, best audio mix, just like I stated, like I stated, um, ready for broadcast. It's, I mean, we see it less, less and less now because our computers are more powerful, but we still see it. I mean, cause you know, we can't all afford a three, $4,000 machine that can do 4K, 8K, you know, we might be using, you know, uh, our little Dell that we've had for a couple of years or we're borrowing from a family member or an old MacBook Air, but at least we can use those proxy files. A type of sample workflow. And here's the workflow that we're gonna be going over this week. We acquire our footage, we import and ingest all our content, the, any stills that we're gonna be using from photography, motion graphics that we made or had someone make for us, uh, music that we had also either made or had made for us. Um, and we convert all of that, all the assets into in a digital format if they need to be, or we just, if they're already digital, we just organize them. Now we get into organization. Uh, now with this, this is a clear system of labeling and folder nesting on your, on your Mac or PC uh, so that all of those ass and assets, so all your assets are your digital files. So they're accessible. That's really it. So that's all organization is. And we just create a folder and we put like video, audio, stills, scripts, documents, et cetera, et cetera. And, and in those folders, we can even make other folders. So subfolders, subfolders, subfolders. So again, it's all about organization. And, and uh, we can do that before we even come into Premiere. Because when, if you drag and drop those folders, the really interesting thing is Premiere can read those folders and create bins automatically. And bins are just folder organization in Premiere. Review and selection. This is the early uh, editing or assembly. Um, and, and that's what, an assembly is a real, is a, um, a workflow or a workspace in Premiere as well. Um, and we use it exactly the same way. This is where we just organize our, our files and our assets. 
and start to build out our best files. And, you know, sometimes in assembly by choosing those best files, I mean, that's really rough cut version number one. We may, maybe we don't make an assembly or, or a timeline, but once we know we start to have things organized, then all we do is drag and drop them in. So that is one way of editing. Um, when you get into bigger shows, that's how a lot of people start to edit, you know, because uh, it's just, these things become very complicated. And instead of just having a timeline with all kinds of files and clips, that can be quite a mess. And we don't want to do that. You know, we want to stay as organized as possible. Review and selection. This is in the beginning phases of assembly as well, uh, where the best parts are marked and highlighted for use. So again, uh, once we have organized our work in the organization, um, we start to then, uh, what I do is I, I start to say, or, or, or the workflow I share is we make subclips because once we have our area, our, like, oh, I want to use this. Uh, I definitely want to use this take. Maybe you have five takes and you say, I'm going to take, use take three. When we look at take three, we'll see that we have maybe the clapper and then we have, you know, all kinds of uh, stuff happen in the beginning. Then the, then the actor calls action or the director calls action. Production happens, cut, but then we still have the other, other, you know, um, the tail end of the clip. So a subclip then allows us to get the parts between action and cut by sending an in and out point, creating a subclip of that main file, which is an additional file. And it's just that part that we want. So um, again, that's becoming the review and selection process. It's the best part. Um, and then we also can put that into its own bin. Assembly is when we get all those pieces and put them into the project in the logical sequence based on the notes or script or any rewrites that come or any notes that come from the director. So the assemblies when we actually put it together. The rough cut is the condensed version of that. It's when we you say, well, we got most of the stuff we want, but we've also started to eliminate. Uh, so editing is really, and this is my philosophy, time-based sculpture. You're sculpting your project. Um, just like a piece of marble. We don't uh, look at a, an object and add to it. Typically, most sculptors see the piece and remove what they don't want. And that's the way we want to think about editing. We remove the love handle, the longhita, right? We want to get rid of that, you know, and just have the, the basic parts necessary uh, for our uh, show slash for our storytelling. Um, you know, we want to make it as accessible, as lean as possible. We don't have too much fat, right? We don't have too much filler. We just want, want it to be the stuff that's the most important. Um, because then we can have more stuff that's more important. And again, that's what makes the show more interesting. And the rough cut um, is when we have the more interesting stuff. It's still looser. Uh, we can have some placeholders. Our audio doesn't have to be finished or, or completely mastered or sweetened. Um, and we can still rewrite. So rough cut is like, okay, here's the idea. Here's where we are. You send it off, let people review, and they give you notes. By the time, you know, we do this a couple times, usually three times is what, how I have in my contracts for my clients. Uh, we do the fine cut, which is close to final version, but we just do minor tweaks, maybe some color, some audio. Um, but, and then after that, we get to picture lock. No more changes are made. All the visual elements are set. This is what we're going to use then for final audio. We send this to our music or audio people, our composer or writes a score, our musicians write a score for us. Uh, our audio mixers then start to fix the audio levels, make sure everything's even, um, and we start to remove any extra noise as well. Uh, finishing, this is in the online edit. This is where we do our color correcting. So this would be the equivalent of audio mixing, but for the picture. Um, if people look, if our actors look washed out, we start to tint their color and we can, you know, spot sections too. We were that sophisticated now in our software. We can say, I just want to do this section. I just want to do this section or I just want to do this. It's not uncommon. That's something that I do a lot. Sometimes I'll just put a little mask around this, you know, the uh, talent's head and then brighten it up just a little bit because that's where you want your attention to go. Um, so with this, with the color correction, the timing or grading, this, that's when that happens. Timing and grading can be used interchangeably. The, um, in that timing was what we used to call uh, color correction when it was on film. Now we call it color grading. 
Um, and at this point, we're also finishing our audio, getting our final sweetening, um, and our and if we have any special effects here, is where we finally get the highest resolutions, the best versions. Um, then we get into mastering delivery, which is where we export out a very final version. We create a final render file. Remember rendering? I mentioned I defined that earlier. This is the creation of a file by the computer to include any changes we've made. Uh, we can also record to a master videotape if we're using a deck. Um, probably none of you ever will, unless you're interested in it. Um, if you're gonna set this to film, we create a cut list for the optical film printer. As, so we send it to them and they do that. Um, we also can create a DVD or a Blu-ray or a final full resolution file as well. So that's all of that is the mastering and then the delivery. Um, when it comes to editing, in terms of, uh, especially the aspects over here, um, in terms of the editing process, one thing that I also want to add in when we edit um, as editors as we think about a lot of the content, remember we want to think about motivations and purpose. We want to think about why are we making these cuts? And, and that's sort of one of the things too as an editor, you start to think about like, well, do I want to make a cut here or make a cut there? How does that change the story? How does it change the feel or the flow? So these are all things to consider as we start our editing journey. And, and that's pretty much what co what's covered in chapter one. So let me go ahead and close this up and let's take a look at chapter two of grammar of the edit. Let's continue. So depending on how you're doing, if you have time, you can either pause and finish or continue with me. Uh, and this one, I think we're gonna be talking, it's gonna be very graphical. So we're gonna be very specific because we're gonna be ta talking about visual material. So it might be a little bit shorter. Um, now, understanding visual material, chapter two, grammar of the edit. Um, when you're working on your show as a director, um, what you really wanna do, and this again, this is my philosophy because I'm coming at this from a post-production perspective, is I always think you're shooting everything in production for your editor. I mean, you really are because you want to give them the best versions of the script possible, but you also want to give them, you know, sometimes you want to give them just that. And it depends. Sometimes you say, you know what, I'm going to give the editor two or three versions of the interpretation of the script and let them look at it and decide, you know, because uh, it depends how much of a collaborator you are as a director. Or sometimes you say, I just, I know what I want. I just want it to be this way. So sometimes you might even give the editor one or maybe two versions of the same thing. And it's up to the editor to decide which one they're going to use. Um, and if you think about that, the editor is the one then that's creating in a lot of ways, the performance. So the actor, sure, they ha they give you the performance, but you choose the one you're going to use. So, you know, it's, uh, many an actor should thank their editor more and more because, you know, we're the ones that actually <laughs> put it all together. Um, now, in terms of coverage and, and storytelling and or let's say writing for scripts and, and filmmaking, keep in mind that uh, if we're talking about narrative storytelling, um, the, ma the, the majority of, of the perspective does come from third person objective. Um, so you, we, as the audience, if you're the viewer, we know usually everything that, you know, the main actor know or the villain know, and that's about it. Um, you know, we don't usually get a sense of everything, but we will get cuts maybe back and forth between the principal characters. Um, so how do, how do we think about that? Well, if, to continue with our Michael Bay Transformer discussion, we'll know everything that the hero robots know Maybe the main characters know, and sometimes the villains know. So we know what Optimus Prime, right? Those of you who know that show, the good robot, the giant truck, we know what he knows. And then we know what Megatron knows, the bad guy, right? The spaceship. When I was younger, he was a gun. So I don't know, whatever it is. But we know usually what the main uh, characters know. Um, now, again, the editor makes meaningful choices for the best content that fits the story or what they feel will be the best version of that for the story. Here's what we look at then in terms of um, the steps of production. And we're going in opposite order in terms of how we're, we're how it's shown. 
And uh, the reason why we're going opposite order, this is the way it appears in the book. So I took this directly from the book. So extreme close up. I mean, that's just a part of the body, a part of the body. Sometimes you just get eyeballs, right? A nose, mouth. We've all seen that. Um, if any of you have seen the Rocky Horror Picture Show, right? It's a very famous uh, cult film. The whole film starts with the lips, right? You know, singing the song. Is a little, I'm not going to do it because it'll make some people disgust it, I'm sure. But uh, uh, we get close to the lips. And I believe um, the analogy was the lips were supposed to be the Dr. Frankenfurter. And if you've seen that show or that movie, you know what I'm talking about. Um, uh, but body parts, right? Body parts. Um, not really something we see in Hollywood movies for the most part in terms of extreme. Uh, but, you, you know, we do if it's for a reaction. Like, like you know, the eyes. Sometimes we'll see the eyes go, oh, like really big, like as a shock. The one, we, the one we usually get are the big close-up or the choker, which is the next one. Now, it's called a choker because... It's a cutoff here right at the, the neck. It's cutting your neck. It's choking you. It's choking your neck. That's why it's called a choker. Close up is just below the neck to just about the top of your head. That's usually the close up too. So those are the two we typically see. Then we have medium close up, which is a chest shot. So it's at your chest here up. So this would be it right here. Medium close up. Mid shot would, would take us all the way down to our hips. And a medium long shot will take us uh, usually just above the knees or around our knee area. The medium long shot we see uh, uh, in the 50s more and um, in American films more than anywhere else. The reason is uh, there were a lot of films made um, or a lot of the shows at the time were Westerns and so they featured cowboys. So we, call, we also call the medium long shot the cowboy because you have to be able to see if someone's carrying a gun. That's why we go all the way down to the knee. Long wide shot is the whole body from head to toe. We see everything, you know, a little headroom and a little feet room. If you take cinematography and lighting, you'll learn more about that, but we need to give you, you know, we need to give our actor a little space. We don't want to make him feel too claustrophobic. Then we have the very long or wide shot. This is again, in relationship to the actor. So now they're a lot smaller. Um, the long wide shot and the very long wide shot help give us uh, an example of the actors or the character's relationship with their environment a little bit more. We see where they are. Extreme long wide shot, um, that can also be interchanged, I think, with a master shot uh, because uh, we don't always uh, see that with an actor. Sometimes we do. I mean, it happens, you know, depends on your show, but usually that's like your master shot. Then we have the two shot, which uh, as an example here, it's, uh, it looks like it's about thigh to the top of the head, so it's like a medium. But we have two characters, or we have our two actors in that shot. And that is a way also to show relationships between the two characters and also in relationship to their environment. The final one is the over-the-shoulder. The over-the-shoulder over shot, then, is a dialogue scene. And that's also to show the relationship of the two, of the two characters with each other. And the over-the-shoulder shot is to give sort of a uh, respectful um, um, content or context of one character to another. Usually one character giving information to the other one and vice versa. And, uh, the one, and if we're going over the shoulder of the one character, um, then we're getting their perspective. We're there. We're uh, learning as they learn. And if you notice especially here in this example that I have. Let me, can I zoom in on that? Oh, I can. Look at that. If you notice, it forms an L. And that's what we want to look for, the L. The head and the shoulder. Head, shoulder. So we look for that L in those over-the-shoulder shots. And that's how, especially in cinematography, that's how you do that. Okay. These are the explanations. So again, extreme close-up, detailed shot, favors an aspect of the actor like eyes, mouth hands, magnification, no environment, usually shown after the master wide shot is useful as a cutaway sometimes for documentaries. So like if we're doing it, if someone's talking, sometimes you cut away to eyes, hands, an object, so you can use it. Uh, again, as an editor, you can get, um, you can come up with the best shot. Big close up or choker, human face, you show your key features, it shows the person and is about the person and only, 
and, or only the face itself. And remember, it's choker cut in the neck. Close up can also be called the headshot, shows the actor's face, but in the context of the body. Hair and neck shoulders are also typically included. Medium close up shot, MCU, not Marvel Cinematic Universe. Or the bust shot, because you're getting the bust here, right? The chest up. Uh, called a two button for the right bottom frame, cutting off the chest in place of the two buttons. You know, if you're wearing two buttons right here. Um, also cuts above the, also can be uh, above the elbow joint. So anywhere up here. Um, again, the bust shot. Medium shot, cuts off at the waist, down to your hips, your waist. Medium long shot. The environment occupies more space than the actor, cuts off just above the knee. Also, again, the cowboy, because you can see the gun. Long shot, wide shot, or the LSWS. Full body shot, but still close to the figure, may also work as establishing shots. Cuts off just above the head and feet, or below the feet. Very long shots, or very wide shots, can also use, be used as an establishing shot, more about the environment than about who the actor or character is or the rela relationship with, with the environment. Extreme long shots, extreme wide shots. Uh, used in exterior shooting, a large field of view, often establishing shot at the beginning of the film, shows the environment. Actors are also less distinguishable or tend to be indistinguishable. They both mean the same thing. Two shot. Two subjects who face each other towards the camera or in profile can add actors to create three shot or a crowd shot. So uh, really preference of the director at that point. And the over the shoulder, the special two shot where one subject is favored by facing the camera and the other subject has the back to the camera, which forms that L that I mentioned with the head and shoulder. Now, in terms of the shot, different types of shot categories, we also have these breakdowns in terms of are they simple, are they complex, or are they developing? And it's a matter of movement more than anything else. So four basic elements of shot creation that helps determine that category. It's about the lens, the which attaches to the camera. Then it's the camera itself, the mount or the support that holds the camera, and the subjects or the, the subjects or the actors and how they're moving. So lens, does the camera lens move? Do you have a lens camera? Or sorry, a zoom camera, <laughs> um, uh, a zoom lens on the camera. That's what we're trying to say. What's, so you're saying, well, what other kind of lens would I have? Well, you might have you know, a prime lens. A prime lens only has one focal point, 30, 45, 60, 200, that's it. But a zoom lens can change between say like a 50 to uh, 150 or you know, 16 to 55, those are typical. Um, uh, so in your lens, does it move? Does, are you changing it, you know, changing that uh, zoom? Camera. Does the camera body itself move like a tilt or pan, you know, like that? That's, that's what we mean. Not necessarily physically move because that's the mount or the support. Does the camera's mount or support move like in a dolly, a tracking shot, a steady cam shot? Um, that's the mount or the support, remember. But for camera, we're just talking about it's stationary, but it's tilted or panned. Subject. Do the subjects move within the shot itself? I mean, that's part of the blocking, right? Are they moving into the camera field of view in the mise-en-scene? Are they moving within the mise-en-scene? Are they moving out of the mise-en-scene? Remember, the mise-en-scene is everything inside of the frame. Now, with simple shots, no lens movement. So you, if it's a zoom, but you don't move it, that's, don't worry about it. No lens movement, simple shot. No camera movement, no tilting, no panning. No movement of the mounts. And it's very simple in terms of the subject movie. Maybe your actors are just talking or maybe their body parts are moving, but they're not necessarily moving a lot within the frame or in or out of the frame. All the action happens in the set, uh, the very finite framing. So think about interviews, you know, as examples of simple shots. Then we have complex shots, um, which incorporates lens movement, a camera movement. So the, maybe you zoom, maybe your camera pilts, uh, pans or tilts. Um, but you have no mount movement, so the, the mount doesn't move necessarily. And again, your simple subject movement. So you could just be on the sticks or your tripod, and you zoom in, you zoom out, and um, um, 
maybe the camera itself tilts or pans, but that's it. But your body does not move. That's complex. Now, a complex shot may contain the pan, the tilt, pan and tilt, lens movement, like a zoom or a focus pull, lens movement in a pan, hiding a zoom by panning the camera, lens movement in a tilt, which hides a zoom by tilting the camera, subject movement in a pan, subject movement in a tilt. The subject or the shot becomes complex if it combines three active elements, which, which is either lens movement, camera movement, or simple subject movement. That's when it becomes complex. The shots with pans or tilts should begin and end with a static frame. That's a great rule of thumb too. Um, and that's also a way to distinguish between usually student filmmakers and uh, more uh, sophisticated or um, let's say learned or, or seasoned veteran filmmakers. Because we usually, remember, we start with static, move, end with static, cut, typically. Now, there are definitely moments when we cut on the movement. It does happen here and there. But again, as you develop your voice as a filmmaker or get better at your techniques, you'll find that that becomes the um, exception rather than the rule because we want you know, our audience to be engaged. And you know, we don't want to bombard them with too much movement because it can become disorienting. Um, now, developing shots. Uh, this is the final category. It does have an aspect of lens movement. It has an aspect of the camera movement, again, just like the other two. But we also include the mount movement. So like a steady cam, or um, maybe we're on a dolly. You know, we have one of those in our department now. You have it mounted on something, so it's moving. And we have more complex subject movement. So this is the kind of thing that you'll see like in big set action pieces, you know, like in the Marvel movies or action movies. Uh, that's those are going to be the developing shots developing slash complex shots because there's gonna be a lot of stuff happening So we see those in the big budget blockbuster movies more than anything else And just as a rule that just incorporates movement in all four elements. That's really it So that's a developing shot when it has everything um, and, and we see that again, we see that more in those big budget movies, but we also um, as you're watching uh, different shows think about um, whether shots are developing or complex, you know, um, does the mount move or maybe it's just, you know, the zoom with a tilt or a pan of some kind. That's really what we're seeing. It can become, uh, as you're watching shows, it can become, um, you know, a, a great exercise and it really does help you develop your eye as an editor to think about like, oh, okay, there was that kind of shot. It was that kind of shot. But that's what uh, my, you know, my dream or my goal or my wish for you would be as uh, you're watching shows, and I imagine many of you are, especially since we're in our lockdown again, pandemic, be, uh, you know, be critical and be engaged with the shows and think about when the edits occur and what types of shots. Think about that maybe for the next week. Because um, I might rewrite one of our my discussion questions to incorporate this lecture, um, just to see who, you know, who, who read this or not. But, um, Keep that in mind and, and um, think about ways for discussion too that maybe you've seen that. Okay. Um, that will end our discussion on chapter two and understanding visual material. Uh, if you have any questions, let me know or let me know in our hourly meeting on Tuesday or Thursday. Um, and uh, I will post, um, just keep in mind that I will keep posting um, these lectures on the modules, and this will be the pattern that we develop. Uh, the next lecture that I post, or or the next the next uh, thing you'll hopefully that you'll watch will be the lab, which will be the demo in Premiere, and hopefully I'll post that up very very soon. All right, you guys have a productive week.